Hello and welcome to this masterclass, which is part of the annual Just Like Us School Diversity Week, a nationwide week-long event where thousands of primary and secondary schools and colleges come together to talk and learn about LGBT plus identities, to celebrate diversity and to make our schools and communities more safe, inclusive and happy places for LGBT plus students, LGBT plus families and our allies. Before we start, it's really important that we all stay safe online this week and beyond. So we've posted some information on online safety in the comments of this video. For today's masterclass, our brilliant guest speaker is Erin Eakins, author, activist, YouTuber and blogger, who writes and talks about, among plenty of other things, what it's like to be queer and autistic, disability justice and fandoms. Her work and words have been featured in media outlets such as The Independent, Huck Magazine, BBC Radio 5 Live, Channel 4 and The Victoria Dabshire Show. Her new book, Queerly Autistic, The Ultimate Guide for LGBTQIA plus Teens on the Spectrum, has just been published and is a wonderful and well-needed handbook which deals with a variety of topics such as gender, sexuality, coming out and self-care in an, in an empowering, clear and engaging way. We're so lucky to have Erin here to present a masterclass today entitled, What Does It Mean to Be Queerly Autistic and Proud? After Erin's talk, she will answer some questions submitted by young people in a Q&A. I'm so delighted to hand you over to Erin Eakins. Thank you ever so much, Hannah. It's, uh, it's amazing to be here. Um, I'm absolutely thrilled to have been invited. Uh, Just Like Us is a wonderful organisation and I'm, I'm so, so happy to be able to talk about this um, for all you wonderful people. Um, so obviously like, you've had a, a brief introduction to me, um, but I'll just do, do, do a quick one myself. Um, so yeah, my name is Erin. I am queer and I am also autistic. And I've just released um, a book, um, which is this one, which I wanted to make as a comprehensive guide for young autistic people who know or think they might be LGBTQIA+, or who are just figuring out kind of that element of their identity. I like to describe myself as sort of an attempter of advocacy and activism rather than sort of an activist. Um, I'm also a fangirl and I'm also a dog owner. Um, we actually have a 12 week old puppy in my house at the moment. So if you hear any any noises, any strange noises, I didn't make them. Um, that's definitely the puppy. <laughs> um, so I as was said, I'm going to be just chatting with you today about being queer and about being autistic, uh, what it means to be queer and autistic, and how you can get to the point to, of being kind of queerly autistic and, and proud of being queerly autistic. So I'm just going to start with a, a quick note on the language that I'm going to be using. Um, so for starters, autistic. Um, I refer to myself as autistic rather than someone with autism uh, because I've come to view uh, being autistic as a massive part of my identity and who I am rather than something that I sort of a disorder that I carry around with me or something that has been inflicted on me rather than it being a part of who I am. Um, in the autistic um, community there is a big push to move more towards uh, autistic rather than person with autism, um, as that's a, a pride thing and a, a kind of recognising it as an identity. Um, I also identify as bisexual and I identify as queer. Um, I identify as queer as in it being used as an um, umbrella term for anyone who isn't straight and isn't cisgender, so anyone who isn't, isn't trans. Um, just a quick explanation around the word queer and why I use it. So. Queer is a reclaimed slur, which means that it's it's a word that has and sometimes still is used as an insult, but the community has taken it back and, and kind of made it an identity and, and a bit of a rallying cry. Um, but because it is still used as an insult, it's really important to respect people's personal preferences around using it and work on an individual basis. So some people don't like it. Um, I personally, um, it's a big part of my identity. Over the last few years, I've shifted more to using queer to describe myself. Um, there's something about it I just love, and it's also tied into me accepting my autism as well. Um, I love the radical and inclusive history of the word queer, how it's used to disrupt kind of our ideas around um, this binary of straight and gay and man and woman. Um, it's also really deeply related to my autism and my autistic identity. Um, 
the idea of that, the root of the word being odd or strange is actually a really positive for me because um, I've spent way too long trying to be normal. Um, and now I'm sort of embracing the oddness and the eccentricity of who I am in terms of being neurodivergent, um, which is a way of saying my brain doesn't work in the standard way, um, which includes things like autism, ADHD, dyspraxia, dyslexia, etc. And in terms of my sexuality. So for me personally, there's a huge amount of power um, in reclaiming it as a good thing. Um, and it's been a huge part of kind of learning to live proudly as a queerly autistic person for me. So speaking of being queerly autistic, um, I'd like to start off with a very broad question that I'm throwing out to you. Um, do just jump in with your answers. And remember, there are no silly answers here. Um, I'd be really interested to hear what people know about what is autism do you know what autism is um so yeah please just jump in um with anything you know about autism hi um well i'm actually autistic myself so um hello um and i i know it to be um a communication disorder um, so it affects the way you communicate with other people um, and it's um, kind of like your it's not like a thing that you have it's more your brain is actually wired in a different way so you're like you couldn't take it out of you because it's what your brain is absolutely love that brilliant thank you <laughs> um, so yeah I've um stolen a, a brief description from um, the Autistic Self-Advocacy Network um, and how they describe it. Um, so in one sentence, autism is a lifelong developmental disability that impacts how we experience and engage with the world around us. And as you said, um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's part of your brain wiring. It's, it's part of who you are. It's, it's not um, like an illness. Um, so some of the main things to um, think about when you think about autism is that we think differently. We might not see the world in the same way as you. Um, we process our senses differently. So, for example, with me, loud noises are a no-go. Hence, these are, these are my headphones um, that I wear all the time. Um, and things like taste and, and touch can be, can be, we can be really sensitive to those things. Or we can be hyposensitive, which means, for example, um, I don't feel thirst properly, so I have to remind myself to drink. Um, we also move differently. You might see us having slightly odd movements. Um, I talk a lot with my hands, for example, um, and you may have heard of excited flapping. I do a lot of that. Um, we communicate differently. Um, so the way that we interact with other people can be can be different. Um, we socialize differently, but the social element is a huge, huge thing and has has been for me. And also we might need some help with daily living. I am uh, I have a full time job. I am also a writer and a speaker um, and I do all these things, but I can't live away from home because I ha I can't actually live independently. So there's um, so, yeah, so we might need help with things that people don't expect that we might need help with. As you can imagine, all of this uh, can impact how we experience being LGBTQIA+, um, and how we experience figuring out if we're LGBTQIA+, or not. So I'm going to start with a little bit about uh, my story. So I came out as bisexual when I was around about 16 or 17. Um, I can't remember the exact age. Um, I've actually blocked out a lot of my teenage years uh, because they were not a fun time for me. Um, but I actually figured out my sexuality due to a, a TV show and a fictional character. Before I'd, I'd kind of never had this, before I saw this, this character have a relationship with a woman and a man, um, before that I'd never really had this idea that you could be anything other than straight or gay. And I remember having crushes on women as, as, a, as a young teenager and, and preteen and thinking, OK, but I also fancy this famous male celebrity, so I can't be gay. But watching um, it was actually Torchwood um, for my sins. I was a Torchwood fan um, and seeing a character, specifically Yanto Jones, who was with a woman and then was with a man. 
it was intriguing to me. And so I moved further in and kind of explored Torchwood fandom online. And I found myself in this little fan community of queer people who'd been through what I was going through. I've since come to understand that that's a really common way uh, to help autistic people figure out their sexuality and their gender through fictional characters and fandom and fan fiction. Um, and I was so excited to be able to talk about this, um, to have the freedom to talk about this in my book, because I've never really seen it talked about in major guidance or advice for young LGBTQIA plus people. That whole idea of being able to figure out your feelings and what they mean through the medium of a fictional character or in a fandom space, um, which I've since learned is a lot of, of, of kind of autistic and otherwise neurodivergent people have that experience. In fact, there, there was, I didn't see much advice for young LGBTQIA plus people that would have been helpful for me at all. Um, for example, everyone sort of assumed that I would automatically know when I was feeling, oh, I'm attracted to this person. Um, but a lot of autistic people um, actually experience some form of alexithymia, which I'm probably pronouncing wrong. <laughs> um, but that just means we sometimes may struggle to understand or recognize our own feelings. So writing the book was really revolutionary for me as it gave me a chance to put down in, in detail and really look into what these things can feel like physically and emotionally and how to recognize them and pinpoint them and say, ah, that is that is attraction that I'm feeling. That's what that is. Um, when no one had ever kind of laid that out for me before. So having the opportunity to do that was was amazing for me. So when I started university, that's where I really tried to come into my queer identity. I threw myself into activism and into the queer scene. But I didn't quite feel as at home as I thought I would. Um, although I felt more connected to these spaces and people than I had in sort of non-queer spaces back home, many of those issues I'd had in, at home still persisted. I still couldn't handle nightclubs. Um, I was still very socially awkward. Um, I still struggled to make healthy connections with people. Um, this actually led to me being so desperate for approval that I found myself away from home and in an abusive friendship, um, which has continued to impact me uh, to this day, um, nine years later. Um, and it's a big part of why I highlighted I highlight in the book on the um, element around relationships that friendships can be abusive too and how you can spot it, because it took me several years to come to that point. So it wasn't the big coming home that I thought it would be. And it wasn't until I was um, out of university, it wasn't until I was actually 23, that I was able to put that final piece of the, of the puzzle of myself together. And that was that I am queer, but I'm also autistic. So I'm just gonna throw another one out back to you. Um, <laughs> Do you think that autistic people are just as likely to be LGBTQIA plus as non-autistic people? And do you have any experience with that? No one wants to come in, that's absolutely fine. I shall move on. <laughs> um, so, in fact, we're, we're actually more likely um, to identify as LGBTQIA plus than non-autistic people to the extent that there's actually a name for it, which is the double rainbow. Um, this references both obviously the rainbow flag of the queer community and the fact that being autistic is referred to as a spectrum um, in reference to the kind of array of colours in the rainbow, um, which signifies that autism isn't a straight line from low functioning to high functioning, um, but that we all sit in different spaces and share kind of um, similar but different experiences and presentations of autism. Um, Functioning labels are terms that are still used by professionals, but are considered quite unhelpful and even insulting by autistic advocates. Um, so just a, a, a kind of a note on that language. So anecdotally and in research, autistic people are likely um, are 
very likely to identify as some form of either not straight or not cisgender. Um, a survey of over 11,000 people in 2018 um, showed that 38% of autistic respondents identified as LGBT+, plus, um, and 23% of autistic respondents identified as something other than cisgender. So this is quite a high contrast to the 2% of the general population that's kind of generally understood as identifying as, as lesbian, gay or bisexual. And there, although there's no robust data that currently exists in terms of national statistics specifically on trans identities, it's estimated that around 1% of the population identifies as something other than cisgender. Whereas in 2020, a study found that autistic people are six times more likely to not identify with the sex that they were assigned at birth. There's actually a brilliant uh, trans autistic uh, researcher and author, and I recommend his books um, about his, his experiences to everybody that they're, they're fantastic, um, has actually some theories on why this, why this may be. He said, um, when you consider our honesty, our preference for truth and fairness, then gender identity is likely to be more fluid and less binary. Why do we need to fit into a mode of social expectation if we truly don't believe this is who we are? The non-autistic world is governed by social and traditional expectations, but we may not notice these or will fail to see them as important. This frees us up to connect more readily with our true gender. That is a um, that is a theory I've seen throughout the autistic community, and it is one I absolutely love as to why we're more likely to be queer or trans. Um, but no one's ever actually been able to definitively pinpoint why uh, the crossover is so high. And actually, much of the research that I found in writing my book on this issue was actually very insulting to both autistic people and LGBTQIA plus people. Um, one that I found um, suggested that autistic people who claimed to be LGBTQIA plus but who hadn't actually had a what they call a same sex experience were clearly just lying about it um, and even suggested that um, autistic men who claimed to be non-straight were just saying that because they were scared of talking to women so very infuriating but the issue with this research as well as it, the wording and it clearly not having any communication with actual queer autistic people is it's all about figuring out why we're more likely to be queer or trans rather than just going okay autistic people are more likely to be queer or trans let's make some research let's make some uh, resources sorry that reflect that and that's why it was so important for me to be able to write this book i wanted there to be something that was um, straightforward and plain talking but also went into the kind of detail on identities and feelings that i needed as a kid it was important to me that autistic teenagers have kind of good and inclusive access to this um, particularly around sex and relationship education um, unfortunately, many autistic people don't get the same advice and support when it comes to sex and relationship education, particularly kind of queer sex and relationship education, um, because we are kind of inherently desexualized and infantilized by society. Um, society doesn't like to think of autistic people as having a sexuality, let alone a queer sexuality. Um, and obviously this, this lack of information that we get given leaves us very vulnerable to, to abuse and to exploring things in a way that isn't safe. So having that was incredibly important part of the book. Um, it was also really important to me as well as kind of figuring it out and relationships and, and sex and um, I, there's a, a, a section on transitioning. It was also really important for me to help other autistic people explore the queer scene after the issues that I'd had. Um, so, for example, I wanted to talk about what the experience of being in a gay club is like, and if you can't handle that, um, things like if you're in a university town, they might have an LGBT plus group that you can get in touch with who will do things like quizzes rather than just clubbing. So there you can, can connect with the community without having to have the sensory overload that is going clubbing. Um, I also have a lot of advice around finding online queer autistic spaces because um, I know personally that being online and through fandom but also just generally online was my connection into the queer community and the queer scene and i really wanted to to kind of push how to do that safely um, and in a way that meant that you were protected but also so that you can find the support that you need 
think more than anything, I wanted to give young autistic people the, the confidence to try things out safely and securely and to take whatever journey that they need to take, whatever kind of forks it takes um, on their road to being queerly autistic and proud. As autistic people, we tend towards liking uh, labels and words that we can use to categorize ourselves. I'm definitely like that. I love a label um, as long as it's a label that I give to myself. But we need to do that in a way that doesn't kind of restrict us or limit us into something that we're not. So, for example, if you can't find a label that describes you in kind of all your quirks and facets, then it's perfectly fine to play around with different labels stick a few together, move between them, or even in some cases come up with your own. I know people who have done that very happily. Um, and it's also really important to know that not everybody who uses the same label necessarily has the same relationship to that label or the same experience to that label. Um, one of the things that makes me most sad when I get messages from people online is people asking me, am I allowed? to identify a certain way because my answer is always well of course you are if this is a label that the or a word that speaks to you then use it try it on wear it around for a bit see how it feels you can then say oh i'm not sure i like this and swap it for something else or you can add a further identifier i just think playing around in that sandbox is so empowering and if your identity is kind of best described by looping together several different labels, then wear that loop quite proudly. Um, for example, for me, there's there's a big area of crossover between bisexual and pansexual. They, they're not the same, um, but they there is an area of, of crossover. And for me, the reason why I use bisexual rather than pansexual, even though I feel like the pansexual label could easily apply to me and how I experience attraction, um, I've settled with bisexual because it's kind of as simple as I like the word, I really like the history behind the word, um, the kind of the activism behind the word, and also out of the two flags, the bisexual flag has my favourite colours in it. <laughs> and if that's the only reason you choose one label over another, that's fine. That's absolutely enough. I think we sometimes forget that labels are a tool of empowerment for us. They're not about restriction. They're about finding freedom in claiming these words and kind of working on that has been a huge part for me of finding my pride in both my queer and my autistic identity. So if you're autistic, your relationship to your gender and your sexuality can be this uniquely wonderful and confusing and messy and fabulous thing. And it's really important that the more we look at the diversity of how we love and how we feel and how we identify, that we need to look at kind of the diversity of, of our minds um, and celebrate that all these spectacularly different brains exist within the queer and trans community. So if you are queer and autistic, I just want people to know that you aren't alone and you aren't restricted. You can find people who understand you. You can find spaces that fit you and you can find and use and play with the words to express who you are. Because at the end of the day, if this little angsty, broken, scared, nerdy little teenager like me <laughs> can get to the point of being queerly autistic and proud, with a little bit of help and support, I know that you can as well. So if you need more information or advice or resources, I do have a, res uh, a resource page on my website, which is queerlyautistic.com. They're the same resources that are in the book, only I do update them more often. Um, you can also buy my book. It's Queerly Autistic, The Ultimate Guide for LGBTQIA plus teens on the spectrum. It's available at any book buying place of your choice um, and it's also available on audiobook format as well so i now i've done my shameless self plug and <laughs> um, i believe some of the lovely young people um that just like us work with have some questions for me uh, which i'm very happy to answer so hit me with your best shot as they say <laughs> thank you so much erin that was so interesting and so empowering um, yeah, exactly. We're going to move on to Q and A, and I do believe that Marco has a question. 
I'm going to mic. Hi, hello. Hi. <laughs> Thank you. Fantastic talk. It was it was really educational for me as well and um, amazing. <laughs> Thank you. And my question for you is that what inspired you to write about being LGBT plus and autistic? Right, so um, the lack of, of other resources, <laughs> um, I'll be honest, the the book came about because I actually went to a book uh, Q&A event with uh, Fox and Al Fisher, who many of you may have heard of, um, and I actually got talking to their publisher because I was looking for a book like this for a family member of mine who is autistic and was transitioning, and she was having a really hard time. and we realized and you know we had the discussion about how there wasn't anything um and i said i write i write a blog um i, I don't know if you're interested we exchanged cards it's the only time i've ever networked in my life and i got a book deal out of it um so yeah it was it was basically there was a huge gap in in the in the market and i knew personally that so many people like kind of lived under that double rainbow and needed um ne needed something like this i would have loved to have something like this um so that's that that's why it's kind of there was a massive need that wasn't being recognized um i'm just the one that was that was privileged enough to be given the opportunity um to do it there is um there's also a, a trans autistic survival guide that's just came out from the same publishers as mine which is actually written by um yan perkis and wen lawson who dr wen lawson who i quoted um so there are there is gradually more stuff coming out but it was a massive gap in 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 the market and i wanted to target people who were like me um, and maybe make it so they didn't have to have it quite as hard as I did. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. And thanks, Erin. Actually, my partner is autistic and I was telling them about this book and they were saying to me, oh, if I'd, ha if I'd had that as a teenager. Yeah. It's, it's amazing. Thank um, you. Okay. Our next question is from Leo. Leo Gerardi. Hi, Erin. Hi, Leo. I'm also autistic, so thank you so much for doing this book. It's amazing. <laughs> um, my question is, what has been your experience of being in LGBT spaces as an autistic person? Mixed. <laughs> um, I remember the first time I went to a gay club uh, at university um, and thinking it would be like, this is going to be my space. This is going to be my people. Um, and I just ended up kind of in the toilets crying because it was very loud and people were touching me and I didn't like it. And I just wanted to go home and I wanted to go home and watch Doctor Who and that was all I wanted to do. Um, so it's kind of, and, and trying to find kind of a quieter space was um, was a bit was a bit difficult um, because I wanted to be in those those historical spaces because the kind of the the clubbing and the pub the pubs and the bars is such an important part of our history uh but i just i just couldn't um get anywhere with it so um i did find kind of um things like my university uh, LGBT association did a lot of campaigning so I got more involved in that um, they also did sort of quiz nights and that's something that I could very easily handle and film nights um, so finding those was really important um, I th found some elements of um, I th there is a uh, there is a strong kind of uh, pressure around aesthetics in the queer community which um, I really struggled with in the same way I struggled with it at, in the non non lgbt uh, community as well that i'd kind of the, the those same issues that i'd had in sort of high school came came up again um because i was really struggling because i was still an awkward autistic teenager <laughs> um, and a lot of those issues didn't go away um since finding kind of more queer and trans autistic spaces i've had a much better time of it um my main spaces with kind of being kind of queer and autistic have been online um, and that's kind of where my community is centered these days although I do occasionally kind of venture out obviously not in the past year <laughs> no venturing out has happened in the past year <laughs> um, but that's kind of finding kind of those that online space for people under the double rainbow has been um, mainly on Twitter but there are forums and things as well um, 
that that's been really important uh, really important for me to finally feel connected to um in queer spaces as well thank you thank you i do think it's so important that our lgbt plus spaces are like inclusive I was yes inclusive for LGBT yeah plus, but i think also, quiet yeah. but also there's there's an element of needing them to, we need spaces without drinking as well yeah absolutely. that's really important because we I know the, the LGBT community has, uh, we, we do have some addiction issues, um, but there's also the, the autistic community has audi has uh, addiction issues as well. So it's really, really important to have kind of those safe spaces. Thank you. Um, I think the next question is gonna be from Lily. Yeah. Hi. Hi. Hello there. Uh, Lily here. Um, I have a question for you. So what advice can you give to someone who is growing up and maybe feels a bit different? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, I think my my first thing would be to just say, I mean, I I get it and I get why an adult coming to you and saying, it'll be fine is so unhelpful um, and I don't want to be that person. <laughs> Um, my advice would be, I think, for me, because obviously I didn't get my autism diagnosis until I was 23, so I'm technically considered late diagnosed, even though I know people who got diagnosed a lot older. Um, so I was odd without knowing why in school. Um, I hope that um, if people are like potentially finding that they connect with kind of some sort of neurodivergency, whether it's autism or ADHD or dyspraxia, that I hope, you know, my, my advice would be try it out, you know, have a look, see if it, if it fits you, ask, ask someone, uh, speak to people um, in the community. That's really important. Um, but I think my, and, and that it, it is so cliche, um, that it does get better but sometimes it doesn't get better on its own um things like going to university if you can that that can be a huge step um reach out online safely um i often say my my best friends who i've been best friends with for over a decade are people i met uh, in fan forums <laughs> um, so that there are people out there that that you you can connect with and it may not make kind of like every day at school easier because that's still going to be really hard but having that as a lifeline is really important um and just to say i've i've, I've been there and I, I know it's really hard and i would hug everybody if i could um and that embracing your oddness is really hard um because the world kind of doesn't want you to um but if you can find people who do embrace your oddness however you do that uh, as i said online was where i found mine um or even if like if you get a dog your dog also doesn't mind how odd you are <laughs> your dog loves you <laughs> in all your eccentricities you know things like that can just be really important to get through this point before you kind of maybe have more freedoms and independence to explore that a bit more um so yeah i don't want to be that that uh, preachy adult <laughs> that says oh it'll be fine just be yourself um i know that it it's hard um but my, my advice would be do reach out and you will find someone who gets you um and it doesn't don't let anybody tell you that an online friend isn't a real friend <laughs> that's my main thing <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I'd like to add to that list by Erin's book. Check it out. Oh, you bought the book. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes, uh, yeah, there we go. I bought the book. <laughs> um, I think we have time for one last question Amazing. from Freya. Are you ready? Thank you for Hi. such an interesting talk. Thank um, you. It's really nice to see someone who's so proud of being autistic and LGBT <laughs> because sometimes it can be hard to be proud of those things. Yeah. Um, so my question is, have you found it easier or harder telling people that you're autistic than LGBT plus? Ooh, that's hard. <laughs> um, I think I've had, I've had more experience telling people that I'm bisexual or, or that I'm queer um, simply because I was doing it for seven years before I got my autism diagnosis. Um, I think personally i think it's um i think people have such preconceptions when it comes to autism um i get people who don't 
think that I can possibly be autistic or that they kind of assume that I kind of got the diagnosis on a fluke. Um, I have been accused of, of being a uh, I've been accused of being part of a conspiracy to water down the autism diagnosis, which is really good fun. Um, <laughs> but um, I think when it comes to telling people, I do think that telling people that I'm autistic, depending on the situation, um, particularly in things like jobs and work, um, because um, I find that if telling them I'm autistic uh, is more likely to have some sort of impact. Um, so yeah, I mean, telling people that I'm autistic is something that I do quite freely now, but for a while I did struggle with it um, because I didn't want people to assume that they knew what I could and couldn't do. Um, but I also needed people to know because I needed them to know what I could and couldn't do. <laughs> so it's that big dichotomy. I think the interesting thing is, it's when you put them together, that's when people get the most disbelieving. Um, like you tell them that you're, you're like I'm queer and it's sort of like okay I tell them that I'm autistic and that it's like oh really oh okay but then when I, you say you're both it's sort of this you're only allowed one identity what are you talking about <laughs> you're only allowed one thing one storyline in, in your in your story um, and I think that's kind of obviously that's why I wrote I wrote, wrote the book because I was like there's so many of us stop it um, Yes, no, it's, it's, it's very dependent on the situation. Um, and it is really interesting how people react when you put the two of them together. Um, I've been, you say, I have got to a point where I'm really proud of both of them. And I'm proud of both of them together as well as separately. Um, so I will sort of sing them from the rooftops because I've kind of got to that point of, I don't care what you think about me. I'm going to do what I want. Um, but I am nearly 30 and it's taken me a long time to get to that place um so oh, i hate saying i'm nearly 30 <laughs> i mean it's taken me a long time to get here and it's taken a lot of a lot of work and a lot of help from other people um and then look i've waffled away from your question a bit but i hope that that's that's helpful but both both of them telling people that you're lgbt plus and telling people that you're autistic they they're really brave things to do um, and I just have, you know, I, I will always kind of just recognize how much that can take and how much courage that takes. And, um, yeah, seeing, um, young, younger people, people younger than me, shall I say, wearing those, those kind of identities proudly and, and, and telling the world is, is, uh, it's great. It's, 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 it's really good. I'm just, I'm so proud of all of you. <laughs> I sound like an old woman. I'm the, I'm the, I'll be, I'll be your mum. I'm very proud of you. <laughs> That's so great. Thank you. I've been told you've got a little more time, so I think Ooh. if Cara could ask their question. Yeah. Hi. Hello. Um, congratulations on your book. It sounds incredible. Um, so my question is, what is it like writing a book and how did you find the experience and what advice would you give to young people who might be interested in writing as well? Well, it was um, it was a long old process. <laughs> um, I was writing it for, luckily I had a, and I would recommend this, I had a publisher who worked in autism and neurodivergence a lot. Um, so they were very... Um, kind of open to me saying I'm really struggling can I have a bit longer to do this um and I actually I think I got three extensions on my deadline um and they really easily I spent weeks kind of gearing up to write emails to them so please can I have an extension and then they get back to me like oh it's fine so <laughs> um my thing would be if you can find um uh, a publisher that kind of you know works in that that area um and is aware of those things that's that's really really important um it's it's really interesting writing a book like this because i felt like i had so much knowledge on some things and not enough on others so the stuff i had a lot of knowledge on i wanted to write pages and pages and pages but that wasn't what the book was about um so there was kind of a level of reining myself in 
um, which I think is really is 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 a is really kind of um, good advice. Um, if if anyone's writing something, get everything down and then go back and be brutal with it, <laughs> um, and take out the the stuff you don't need. Um, that was really helpful for me. Um, I, it's it's an amazing experience to write a book, but it is very stressful. Um, make sure you've got support. Um, if that's from your publisher or your family or your friends or your online friends, um, that's 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 really important. Um, and keep pushing through because there were a lot of times when I thought this book isn't getting finished, um, and it's kind of here now and it's very weird. Um, do put yourself out there. Do you get in touch with publishers. Um, I was really lucky in how I got my book deal. It's not normal. Um, I'm still a bit pinching myself about it. Um, a lot of the time you do have to submit. And I would say when I signed my contract for this book, I didn't have a literary agent. Um, and that's something that's really important to me to change before I, because I don't, I still don't have one. Um, that's something that I'm working on to to change because I don't want to sign any contracts for a further book, which I'm planning on working on, um, until I have a literary agent there to kind of support that element and to make sure that you're not to say I was treated badly, but just to have someone there who understands what these contracts mean and what you're signing and can barter with um, for maybe slightly better deal or, or slightly kind of you know be on your side. Um, I think that's that's really 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 important. And I think my final one is just go for it. I've wanted to I've wanted to publish a book since I was I started writing novels when I was about six. Um, and I always thought I'd write novels. And then at the age of what, 26, 27, I get the opportunity to write something that is very much not a novel um, and kind of found my niche. And it's it's kind of overwhelming. Um, so, you know, Keep keep going. You you will you will get there. Um, and I just think everyone, your voices deserve to be heard. So yeah, uh, that was again very waffly, but I hope it was helpful. Um, and so if anybody um, has you know wants to kind of find out more, I found Twitter was a really good place um, to kind of um, reach out to other authors and, and kind of get their input as well. So that's been really important for me, um, has been connecting with other people writing in the same circles that I'm writing in. Uh, so other autistic authors, um, finding them was really important for me. Um, so do reach out to those people, you know, don't, you know, if you reach out to like the big millionaire authors, they may not get back to you, but <laughs> the more normal people think that they can be a really good source of, of advice. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Erin. I feel very inspired to go back to writing my dissertation after this. Yeah. I'm nice <laughs> mode. I think we have time for one more question, which you might have just touch on the answer a little bit from Lily. Lily, if you're ready. Yeah. Uh, so I have one last question for you. So what's next? Well, what's next? Um, well, I recently started a YouTube channel, um, which I'm trying to um, upload to semi-regularly, um, but I'm trying to get a better schedule on, on that. Um, and it's been a really good experience. I'm currently using my phone to film, so it is very rudimentary YouTube, but I'm, I'm really enjoying it. Um, so I'm hoping to kind of build that a bit more and, and kind of do more regular uploads on there because um, I, I do a lot of my advocacy on Twitter, but I like to be able to talk about things. Um, I feel like I can get more um, out than in a Twitter thread. Um, I'm also, um, so I've got my, my website, which I try and, and write things on and update. And I am currently working on a proposal for my next book to try and get a literary agent and, and then maybe look to, to publish with the same publishers again. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think I've got a lot of ideas. I, I would like to write another book uh, that is. And when this pandemic is over, I would like to come and talk to more people in person. Um, it's it's been a very weird year for us all, um, and it's been a very weird year to publish a book um, because it, normally you do launch events and, and Q and A's and speak at conferences, and obviously a lot of that's not happening right now. Um, so I really would love to get out there and kind of 
talk to more particularly more young people who I wrote the book for um that's kind of my goal but yeah um next book proposal which will be another guide but a broader guide to living your life as an autistic person and navigating all that stuff that everybody knows how to do this well I don't know how to do it so <laughs> you know it's like drinks with colleagues what are they I don't know how to do that here's some tips um so, you know that's kind of that's where I'm going with my next my next one so um yeah lo lots in the pipeline and obviously cuddling my my new puppy um she, she that that's a big goal for the next uh foreseeable future uh <laughs> Well, I know I speak for everyone when I say I'm so excited for your new book. I can't Yay. wait. Sounds amazing. Um, in fact, that brings us to the end of today's masterclass. Um, thank you so much, Darren, for that amazing and informative talk. To all of you watching and to Just Like Us for organising these masterclasses as a part of their School Diversity Week 2021. You can find out more about School Diversity Week on the Just Like Us website, which is www.justlikeus.org or on Facebook at Just Like Us, or on Instagram or Twitter, which are both at Just Like Us UK. If you'd like to see and hear more of Erin's work, her new book, Purely Autistic, is available in bookshops and online. Her website is under the same name, www.queerlyautistic.com. And you can check her out on Twitter, at Queerly Autistic, or on YouTube by searching for Queerly. I'd like to just remind you all again that it's really important to stay safe online this week. And if you need some more information on how to do this, take a look at the comments of this video. Thank you once more to Erin for such a wonderful and interesting masterclass. Thank you.